Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Cole, sleep medicine specialist and bona fide chronic insomniac. Welcome to the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast. Remember, knowledge is empowerment, and if applied correctly, it can help you biohack your way to a better night of sleep, just like I did. If this resonates with you, please follow me on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of the Sleep is My Waking Passion podcast. Today, I'm very excited. This is going to be another sleep and mental health episode. I have a wonderful guest with me. This is Dr. Nishi Bhopal. She is Harvard-trained sleep. Dude, these people that I get on my show are just simply amazing. She is also a psychiatrist, specifically an integrative psychiatrist. Nishi, welcome. Thank you for having me. So you are based out West. You now are the founder, the owner of Pacific Integrative Psychiatry. Yeah. So I have a private practice. I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's telemedicine, though. So we see patients all across California. And it's called Pacific Integrative Psychiatry. And so we help people with anxiety, depression, and sleep issues, of course, through an integrative holistic approach. So what that means is we do conventional psychiatry. So we do medication management and conventional therapy, but we also have a focus on gut health and nutrition and mind-body practices, which we're going to talk about today a little bit as well. Yes. Today's focus is really going to be on that mind-body connection, and she's going to give us her top five stress reduction tips for improving sleep. Now, you also are, as much as a busy bee that you are, you've created a new program that's sort of targeted toward educating healthcare providers. Can you share with us a bit more about that? Absolutely. So I have a program called the Clinical Sleep Kit. It's set up as a membership. Clinicians can learn the practicalities of clinical sleep medicine that they didn't learn in residency or in medical school. Medical students receive an average of about two hours of sleep education, which is kind of crazy, right? Like all of our patients have to sleep. And you know what? That's actually an improvement from way back when, when I was in med school, there was zero sleep education. And that's sad that it's only two hours. I absolutely agree. I think back and I probably got maybe 30 minutes or 60 minutes of sleep medicine education across medical school and residency. So to fill in that gap, I've created this program. It's called the Clinical Sleep Kit. Clinicians get monthly mini trainings. It's really digestible, easy to understand, very practical. So this is not a fellowship. You know, this is not hours and hours of academic information. It's really small bites of clinical sleep tips that you can use in your clinical practice. And so it's for outpatient psychiatrists and primary care physicians primarily. This is so cool and so necessary. Please, healthcare providers out there, if you are listening, really consider checking out her program. I think it's so, so important, the work that you are doing. Okay, Ms. Harvard, we're going to move on. Before we get to your tips, I wanted to talk a little bit about the stress response. And please chime in if this pulmonary critical care brain of mine sort of misses the mark. There's no ego in this. I'm doing the best I can. But I actually started getting a little obsessed about the stress response kind of based on my personal experiences. I, especially having managed treating COVID patients, really found myself on edge all the time. And I really would feel like if something was upsetting me, it felt like I had no control over how I was going to respond to that. I literally felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I'm like, I cannot control what is going on in my mind. I feel really out of control. And it actually was quite scary. And what I learned about that was that that was actually part of this process called amygdala hijack. And I was like, what? I had no idea, never thought about that. That was one of those things that you learn like your neurology rotation, you promptly dump out of your head. So I went back and I did a little reading. So in a nutshell, how I would explain it to our listeners would be, back in the day, we needed to have a sense of danger, right? We still need that. You know, if somebody's going to, a kid's going to run in front of your car and you need to hop on the brakes, like you need to have an immediate ability to respond to perceived danger. Somebody's running around trying to hurt people and you've got to duck for cover. I mean, it's really part of our natural human response. If you think about evolutionarily, right, this is like back in the day, we had to run away from the saber-toothed tiger. There seemed to be a lot of physical threats that we were looking at. Nowadays, the threats look totally different. Now it's just stress from work, trying to take care of patients during a pandemic. 
your boss coming down at you, having a deadline you need to meet at work. So they're sort of more intellectual threats rather than physical threats, but a response is really the same. So my understanding of it is you basically have information that comes into your brain and your amygdala is going to start processing that. The amygdala is a part of the brain that was actually discovered in like 1822 by a German scientist and deep in a part of our brain called the temporal lobe. And the amygdala really starts to shoot messages out to different parts of the brain. So it'll activate the hypothalamus and that it's called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. But really, that is another part of our brain that really controls the control center of our brain. And that really is deeply involved in like the autonomic nervous system. So we have our sympathetic nervous system, which is our quote unquote fight or flight response that a lot of folks have heard about. And then you have your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest as I learned it in medical school. And there's a lot of control over things like your breathing, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your digestion. The hypothalamus sends signals to different parts of the body, including the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands, you know, if if the sympathetic portion of our nervous system is activated, the adrenal glands are going to hit the button. They're going to hit the adrenaline button. Everybody kind of is familiar with adrenaline, also known as epinephrine. That sends back signals to the other parts of the body. And then we also have the amygdala sending information to the front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, and that sort of controls our emotional responses to stress. So yes, we can have this perception and our body gets triggered by that, but then our prefrontal cortex is like, hey, is this really something you need to freak out about or not? And what I realized with this amygdala hijack or my rudimentary understanding of it is essentially that that connection, it's almost like the prefrontal cortex can no longer control with the amygdala sending it. It's just like, I've got to react to this right away. I can't seem to put a pause button on this. I can't seem to take that breath. And any one of my healthcare professional colleagues out there, you take call. And if you have a particularly difficult call situation, be it because you're on a shift for COVID or be it just that your call schedule's aligned with multiple days in a row. I can tell you, we used to do a call schedule that's about seven days in a row. We took call 24 seven. And for me, progressively, as I got paged every night and had trouble going back to sleep and my sleep levels went down, my mood began progressively worse by the end of the week. So I'd start off and be like, hey, what's up? And I'd end the week with like, do not even look at me. I have four more hours to go and I just need to get through my day. And, you know, I didn't really like that version of me. But it did, to a certain extent, sort of reassure me that, number one, I'm not alone. This is part of the human condition. And number two, there was an explanation for why I felt so out of control. Now, I know you were telling me you're based sort of like in the Silicon Valley kind of area outside of San Francisco. Talk to me about how stress in your patients manifest. And also, too, if you agree with how I've explained this, because if you have anything to add, by all means. That was a really great explanation of how the stress response works. And as you were saying, you know, when you've got that constant firing of the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex just kind of shuts down. It's overwhelmed. And so that's when you get into these states of emotional dysregulation, or it's hard to make decisions, it's hard to focus and concentrate. People experience brain fog or they feel spacey. And then you couple that with sleep deprivation, causing this emotional dysregulation, plus the constant firing of the amygdala and this this activated stress response. And we're in that sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze response, you know, most of the time, many of us are. So yes, it's going to make it really hard to function during the day. And so we see this in our practice. We work a lot with engineers, but we also have a cohort of patients who are health practitioners. So we see quite a few therapists and nurses and physicians. And then we've got another cohort of people, since we're in California, from the entertainment industry. Mm. Everyone's stressed out. <laughs> All right, that's the <laughs> <laughs> No matter what industry you're working in, you're probably stressed out. That's kind of a function of, of our modern society and the way that things are set up. As you were saying, we don't have these external life-threatening stressors all the time, like we might have way back when, when we lived out in the fields, in caves or whatnot. We don't have saber-toothed tigers chasing after us, but we've got work deadlines. 
we have sprints at work, as they call them in the tech world. They're doing these like two week sprints where they're working round the clock with sleep deprivation as being a big part of that. We have constant demands from family friends, people can contact us at any hour. That wasn't even true when I was growing up, right? We didn't have cell phones. Oh, true. So we've got all this stimulation all the time, right? And people expect you to respond right away. There's just so many demands on our nervous system that many of us are in that fight, flight, or freeze state most of the time. But the good news is that there are ways to regulate that. So I just want to highlight that you made a really good point, which perhaps we did not emphasize in the beginning, which is we are reflecting not on the intermittent episodes of stress that can occur. That's just life. But we're talking about the sort of incessant, recurrent, chronic stress. And you have some really interesting, creative ways to manage chronic stress. And when we talked, I was just blown away by some of the techniques that you had suggested. I want to also just emphasize that stress is not a bad thing. It keeps us safe. It's protective. Acute stressors happen in life, and that's okay. We're not trying to get rid of stress. We actually want a healthy stress response. That is how we function in life. We're not trying to quiet our sympathetic nervous system all the time. We need it to be activated. That's how we survive. But when it becomes chronic, that's when we can get into more longer-term disease states, high blood pressure and cardiac issues and depression, and the list goes on. All right. Tip number one, what would you talk about? We can probably start with micro versus macro practices. So I think of macro practices as your foundational health practices that keep your body functioning optimally. So these are getting enough sleep and getting good quality sleep. Nutrition, I think of as like a macro practice. So, you know, eating well and then exercise and movement. Right. So these are our big macro practices. But what I would like to share are the micro practices. These are small things that you can do throughout the day to help reduce your stress levels. And so what is a micro practice? So there's essentially three elements that I like to identify. So one is that a micro practice is quick. It only takes a few seconds or a few minutes. It's easy. So you can easily incorporate it into your daily routines. You don't need any special equipment or resources to do them. And they're effective. Not only are they effective, but they get more effective over time the more you do them. Great way to classify what you're saying, the macro versus the micro practices. Really love that. Yeah. So maybe we can talk about some micro practices. I like to categorize them into four buckets. Think, breathe, move, and rest. So those are four categories of micro practices you can incorporate into your daily routines. So the first one is think. So this is essentially noticing your thoughts and then working on reframing your thoughts. Noticing your thoughts, just simply doing that is very powerful because most of us are having automatic thoughts that come up throughout the day and we're not necessarily aware of them, but those thoughts do have a downstream effect on our nervous system. So what we think affects how we feel. So if we can start to notice the types of thoughts that we're having, then we can actually do something about them. We can work on them. We can reframe them. But the first step is just starting to notice. So what I recommend to people is pick a couple of checkpoints throughout the day. So maybe it's first thing in the morning, maybe it's midday or at the end of your workday. And just give yourself a few seconds, you know, 20, 30 seconds just to check in and notice, hmm, what am I thinking about this morning? Or what was I thinking about during the day? What kinds of thoughts was I having? An example of this with specifically about sleep might be when we see this with patients who have insomnia, first thing in the morning when they get up, they might think, oh, I had such a crappy night of sleep today is going to suck, right? Like that that's a typical thought someone with insomnia might have. And how is that going to affect how they go through their day, right? It's not setting a good tone for the day. So just starting to notice if you're having those kinds of thoughts. Or even first thing in the morning, uh, people might have the thought of, we see this with our patient population here is like, oh my God, how am I going to get through the day? I've got so many meetings. There's no time. Right. No time for anything. I, I'm not going to be able to work out. I'm, you know, like it's just this cascade of thoughts that creates a cascade of stress. So one thing that I do in the morning is I tell myself today is going to be easy. I I can handle it. I can handle whatever comes to me today. And I especially do that if I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed or burned out or fatigued. That is such a great suggestion. I'm going to take it one step further. What I have also found is that thoughts 
we can tend to judge our thoughts. This is a good thing. This is a bad thought. And I think that actually accelerates the stress as well. Like, okay, I'm going to have a bad day. And you set your tone like you've made a judgment on how you're going to feel. And for some folks, me, I'm guilty. I've been that. You almost feel guilty about feeling like you're going to have a bad day. Like now you've judged yourself because you're like, well, I'm in a bad place and now I'm a bad person because I'm having bad thoughts. And it's like I, if I had any one thing I would say in addition to what you're advising would be try not to judge the thought, just sort of be with it. And to your point, try to restructure in a way that's positive. If you're the kind of person who feels compelled to take action, I would argue that I'm that type of personality. One of the things that I do in addition to trying to reframe is if I know I have a lot of things going on, I really have found that giving myself that 15 minutes or that 30 minutes in the day, essentially making an appointment with myself. I've heard David Goggins refer to that, like he's making an appointment with himself in the morning and there's nothing else that's important. But especially on those particularly hectic days, just going through it and saying, okay, these are the real main things I'm going to accomplish. I can't get everything done on my list, but these are going to be like the top five priorities or the top three priorities. And I know I can nail these. Everything else, okay. They're just going to fall a little bit lower on the priority list. And it also helps you sort of frame your brain so that you feel in control of what your day, what your quote unquote crazy day is going to be like, especially if you had a poor night's rest. I love that. That's really important what you were saying about not judging your thoughts. What I advise to people is when they're going through this process of developing awareness and and noticing the types of thoughts that they're having is to do it without judgment. So we call this non-judgmental awareness. Even when you're reframing, some of my patients will tell me, well, today was a really difficult day. Something really bad happened. And I don't want to reframe that to be positive. And that's totally fair, right? We don't want to fall into a pattern of toxic positivity. Great point. That's trap. So what I advise to people is reframe it to something that's more realistic. Because often when we're in that stress response, our brain is going to the worst case scenario. So we might start catastrophizing or thinking about For example, I was was talking to somebody yesterday, one of my patients, and she's worried about layoffs. There's been a lot of layoffs in the tech world over here, and she was worried about that. And that's a real realistic concern. So we're not going to reframe that to something positive. Oh, no, everything's going to be fine. Like, that's just not realistic. And you can't authentically buy into that, right? And that's where the tension can start to come in. Authenticity, key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so, So we can reframe a thought like that to, okay, well, if I do get laid off, I'm not going to end up in the gutter. I'm not going to be homeless. I have savings. I can look for another job. I've got a network, right? So we're just reframing it to something that's more realistic. So that was a great point that that you just brought up about the non-judgmental aspect. And then another tool in this think bucket is also what you were saying about making an appointment with yourself. I like to call this like a brain dump. So you can just take a piece of paper and just dump out, just write all the things that are swirling around in your head because there's, it's like a big ball of yarn. It's hard to like tease out the different thoughts because they're just kind of jumbled up. So by writing them down, you can actually get clarity. And then you can go in and prioritize, as you were saying. Okay, well, these are the two or three items that I can actually do something about. I can take action on these. And that will give someone a sense of, a sense of agency. Talk about a bit, if you could, regulating your nervous system in the moment. Because I think that kind of gets into your other bucket, which is breathe. Yes. So breathing is one of the most effective ways to regulate the nervous system. And what I encourage people again to do is just start to notice how you're breathing. So notice how you're breathing when you're stressed out, when you're tired, and then notice how you're breathing when you're feeling relaxed or you're feeling present. Just see what the difference is. And typically, when we're in that sympathetic nervous system state, our breath is shallower and it's faster. So you're running away from that saber-toothed tiger. So you're going to be breathing faster. You may not even be breathing through your nose. You may be breathing through your mouth a little bit more when you're in that stressed out state. So we can consciously send a signal to our brain and to our body that we're safe by regulating the breath. And there are lots of different breathwork techniques out there. So I recommend to people try some different ones out and see what feels good for you. But there's a few simple ones. One is called box breathing. And this technique is used by Navy SEALs in their training. 
So they're trained to do this box breathing technique because, of course, they're under high stress situations. They have to be focused. They have to be steady. So box breathing is, is one of the techniques that they use. And essentially what it is, it's breathing in the pattern of a, of a box. So you breathe in for a count of four. You hold it for a count of four. Exhale for a count of four. And then hold again for a count of four. So it's equal amounts of inhale, hold, exhale, hold. And so that's something that only takes a few seconds. And you can do that at different checkpoints throughout the day. So what I tell people to do is just do it before each meeting or do it hourly or do it before a meal. Just pick like a few checkpoints and just do it then. So box breathing is one type. Another really simple one is a one to two breathing ratio. You inhale for, let's say, a count of four again. So you can inhale for a count of four and exhale for a count of eight. So it's just a one to two ratio. And you do it for whatever duration of time is comfortable for you. So it's not like you have to be sitting there timing it on your watch, you know, or anything like that. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be comfortable for you. But the key is having a longer exhalation with this technique. The one that I have tried, Andrew Wiles talked about it, but he's not the only person, would be what I call the four, seven, eight technique. And I have definitely used this if I've been set off or that brain's been set off and I don't want anybody to know. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to be in control of this crazy amygdala response of mine. It's not going to get the better of me. And believe me, I think mine is the size of a watermelon or something. I don't know. <laughs> so I'll breathe in for four, hold for seven, and then exhale for eight. So it's a little bit of a modification of that. But at the end of the day, in addition to just trying to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, it just gives you that time to allow for that whole process to calm down, right? It takes about 20 minutes for that like amygdala response to really just sort of chill. So I would highly encourage that just personally, just try it. If you're like, I'm going to just lose it right now, I can't. And that has helped me because I'm, I don't know if it's my half Korean blood or what, but like when you light that match, it's like, boom. And I'm like, no, no, please try to put the fire out. So I'm breathing on it. <laughs> Absolutely. No. And I, I love the four, seven, eight technique as well. And me personally, like I'm prone to anxiety. Like my nervous system can get really revved up, especially on a work day. And I've got patients back to back and meetings and, you know, all kinds of stuff going on. So I use the four, seven, eight technique as well. And the way that I do it is I just do it before every patient encounter. Wow. I see my patients on Zoom in the privacy of my own home. I do a 478, a couple of those um, before I see each of my patients. And it really does make a difference. I'm going to try that. I am. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Like I said, breath is one of the best ways to calm your nervous system in the moment. And it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, it's free, right? No side effects. Every, anyone can do it. Uh, so I highly recommend trying some of those techniques. Mm -hmm. The next bucket is move. Movement we often think about in terms of exercise. But I'm not talking right now about going for a run or going to a yoga class or something like that. All of those things are helpful too, but those I would categorize as our macro practices. A movement micro practice is something that is really simple that you can just do in the space that you're in right now, whether you're at home or in your office or even in your car. Don't do it while you're driving, but, <laughs> <laughs> right? but it's something you can do anywhere. Examples of this would be stretching. So simply standing up and stretching your arms over your head. If you're sitting, if you're on the bus or something, or you're on the subway and, and you can't get up and stretch, or you, you don't want to alarm anyone around you, you can just do like a simple neck roll or just like a head stretch, right? So these simple things, again, are sending a signal to your brain that we're okay. We're safe. We don't have to be tense. We can relax our body. Another one is, you might do this with kids, which is shaking the sillies out. When kids are kind of hyper, you can tell, okay, shake, shake the sillies out. So get up and like, they just literally shake it out. We can do <sighs> doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> yeah. And that's great. And we can do this as adults. And it's actually really important we do this as adults because kids and animals naturally will do that. They'll be wiggly and squiggly, right? And you'll see your dog. Look at my six-year-old, 100%. 100% squiggles. And my dog does that naturally. Like, you know, he'll shake it out. But as adults, what happens is we get locked in. We become stiff and tense and locked in and withdrawn. And so we want to counteract that by loosening up and literally shaking it out. I'll use this after I see a difficult patient. 
right? If I, if I had a difficult encounter or, or a challenging meeting um, after that, I'll get up and I will literally just like shake it off. And it sounds so simple, but it does make a big difference. Awesome. I do want to ask you about something that we chatted about prior to this meeting, which is folks, especially since you're in the tech world, you commented on this. And maybe this sets into your last point, which is rest, but consumer wearables and some of the anxiety that sometimes it can create. It can be good, but it also might not be so good. Wearables. Yeah, this is a huge topic. Like you said, you know, we're in the Bay Area. We get a lot of biohackers, right? So people who are, they've got their Aura Ring, their Fitbit, their Apple Watch, they're listening to podcasts and taking supplements and trying nootropics and all this kind of stuff. How do we navigate this? Well, with consumer wearables, specifically for sleep, there are pros and cons. So they can be helpful if you are tracking your sleep, if they help you stay on track with getting enough sleep. So for those of us who are bedtime procrastinators, your or I have an aura ring. So my aura ring will send me some right here. Yeah. Just got go. one. Yeah. It's great, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my aura ring will send me a, a message on my phone saying, okay, time for bed, time to wind down. And I need that. Like I, I can totally end up delaying my bedtime and it's a whole thing. But where these cannot be helpful is sometimes people can get into a pattern that's actually been described as orthosomnia. This was described by researchers in Chicago a number of years ago when they saw patients coming in specifically to discuss the results of their wearables with regard to sleep. They weren't having, ostensibly weren't having sleep issues. I've seen them. They just that started. is real. Exactly. It's totally <laughs> real. Like they're feeling fine, right? They, their sleep is fine. But then they're like, oh, but my aura ring said I only got 3% REM sleep and now I'm worried. Orthosomnia is when people start to get fixated on getting perfect sleep, which as we both know, there's no such thing. These wearables can start to cause more anxiety than necessary. So what I recommend to people is that if you if you notice that you're getting fixated on the data, just take a break from the wearable and also take the results with a grain of salt because the uh, sleep staging is not as accurate as a sleep study, right? We're just not there yet with the technology and the wearables. So just take that with a grain of salt. Don't worry too much if it says you only got, you know, 5% REM sleep or whatever. We can't really, you know, use that data. It doesn't really mean much. But at the end of the day, the most important metric is how you feel, right? And the wearable can maybe give you a little bit of guidance on how to improve your sleep. But checking in with yourself again and noticing how you feel is the most important thing. Don't let tech rule your life. In essence, like, believe in yourself you are the perceiver of your own life and don't let something that somebody made as cool and niche as it is, and maybe you even worked on that technology yourself if you're in that area where you are. But at the end of the day, it's it's all about your perception. I so agree. So, so agree. The last bucket I'll just mention with our micro practices was the rest bucket. So yeah, so sleep falls into that. Again, you know, I, I think of sleep as like a macro practice, foundational practice. But micro practices for rest, and this one's really helpful for people who are working on a computer all day. Like I, I work remotely, so I'm on my computer like all the time. A really simple practice you can do is just closing your eyes for a few seconds in between meetings again or hourly. Yeah, we can do it right now. I just did it. <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so again, you can just do that, you know, at different checkpoints or hourly or whatever, just for a few seconds. It doesn't have to be for a 30 minute meditation session or anything like that. And by closing your eyes, it gives your eyes a visual break. It also helps to increase alpha waves in the brain, right? So those are the, the brain waves that we see when our eyes are closed. So it gives your brain a little bit of a break as well. So that's a really simple one. And then the second micro practice in this rest bucket is simply slowing down. And this is one that I use a lot because I can, I can start talking really fast. I can start moving really fast. I can eat really fast. So just slowing down whatever activity you're doing. So slow down your speech, slow down your movements, eat a little bit slower, walk a little bit slower. That again tells your nervous system that you're safe, that you don't have to be in this sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze response. I'm smiling and kind of chuckling because I'm right now picturing my husband when I start getting really animated about something. And then it's like the jersey like, Bloop. I should start talking super fast. And then my voice starts to rise. And now I'm like loud and fast. And he's like, Elson, deep breaths, like calm down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are so guilty of that. You don't even realize it. Like, I don't even notice it. It just is 
part of my conversation. Like it's just that part of my uh, passion for whatever I'm talking about. I'm like, he's right. That is such a great, great. You you've offered so many super cool suggestions that are really uh, user friendly, totally free. And what it comes down to, I think, would be just being mindful that you have these available to you. So when you start feeling like you're out of control and and that this is not possible for you, yes, it is. You can do this. And we circle it back to sleep, but it's all really related because how you feel about what's going on during your day, all the stressors accumulate. And often you don't really realize how much they do until the end of the day when you're trying to get to sleep. And then all of a sudden you have the anxiety about getting to sleep because you haven't released any of that stress throughout the day. So what I take away from what you're saying is that if you can incorporate some of these little, simple, not a lot of time necessary techniques, you could actually sort of subtly reduce your stress over the course of the day, which will make your evening that much easier and reduce that sort of sleep anxiety, if you will. Would that be fair to say? That's exactly right. And you know, the thing is that when we go to sleep, our parasympathetic nervous system has to be active, right? Like we're in our parasympathetic state when we're falling asleep. And what I see happening with with folks is that they're going through their day, they're super busy. You might not even be stressed out. You might just be really busy, even if you're not feeling like overwhelmed by stress. But even when you're busy, you're in that sympathetic nervous system state. And so what I see happening though, is that people expect their nervous system to just switch on and off, like flipping a switch, right? So I left the room, light switch off. Oh, no, no, honey. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. And I use this analogy of it's like a bullet train. So even a really fast bullet train has to slow down to get into the station. It doesn't just come to a complete stop immediately. And our nervous system is like that. So even if you're like a bullet train all day, you do have to slow down to be able to go to sleep at night. The idea of doing these practices is not only to regulate your daily stress levels and your nervous system, but also to support you with getting good quality sleep at night. By slowing the train down. Oh, what a great analogy. Nishi, this has been so much fun. I cannot thank you enough for agreeing to meet with me and speak with me. I'm so glad that Val knows you. It's one of the things in the sleep world that's so fun is you realize it's like six degrees of who knows who. And inevitably, there's some relationship amongst us all, which is really, really nice. So in the interest, because I know you're a busy gal, in the interest of wrapping up, we're just going to say that Nishi Bhopal. She is wonderful. She is available at the Pacific Integrative Psychiatry. You can just go to the website. You can find out all about her. If you are interested in a sleep consultation with myself, I'm currently seeing patients in California, New Jersey, and Georgia, soon to be New York as well. And you can go to the website. It's oak.care slash sleep. I am also in the process of creating my own website, which is asktheSleepMD.com. It's under construction, as they say, but there's going to be lots of cool stuff there. So please check us out. We are here to help. We are both really passionate about what we do. Any final words, Nishi? Thank you for having me on. And if there's any healthcare practitioners listening, you can also check out my YouTube channel. It's called Intra Balance, I-N-T-R-A Balance. And so I've got more information about sleep for health practitioners there. But no, thank you. And, you know, I just wanted to emphasize that Like you said, all of these things are free. We all have access to them. So give them a try and and see how you feel. Great advice. Great advice. Thank you. I really hate to have to do this, but these are my terms and disclaimer. This podcast is intended for persons 18 years or older. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The words and other content provided in this podcast and in any linked videos and materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice. If the listener or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately licensed physician or other healthcare worker. The views expressed on this podcast and YouTube channel have no relation to those of any academic hospital practice or other institution with which the authors are affiliated. There is a detailed terms of use agreement. You can see it all on the YouTube channel. In the interest of brevity and the fact that it's legalese and really hard to read, I am not going to read it. But accessing, reading, or otherwise using the podcast 
or YouTube channel does not create a physician-patient relationship between you and me. Providing personal or medical information to me does not create a physician-patient relationship between you or me or any other contributors to this podcast. Nothing contained in the site is intended to establish a physician-patient relationship to replace the services of a trained physician or healthcare professional, or otherwise to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You hereby agree that you shall not make any medical or health-related decision based in whole or in part on anything contained in the site. You should not rely on any of the information contained in the site and related materials in making medical or health-related or other decisions. You should consult a licensed physician or appropriately credentialed healthcare worker in your community in all matters relating to your health. You agree to indemnify and hold the author harmless from any claim or demand, including attorney's fees, made by any third party as a result of any content posted or made available to you by the site, any violation of law that occurs by you through the site, or anything you do using the site or the content contained therein. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast.